Welcome to another episode of the 50 States of Fossils. Today we're going to be talking about a state that's probably one of the most popular for collecting fossils. While the geologic history isn't that long, it's mostly fossils from the Cenozoic, the last 65 million years. There are ample areas for people to collect. Welcome to Florida, the Sunshine State. The oldest rocks that can be found on the surface of Florida are about 40 million years old during the Eocene epoch from limestone known as the Avon Park Formation. Older fossils do exist, but require special coring equipment that drills deep into the Earth's surface. Florida Eocene fossils are exclusively marine and are generally preserved in rock called limestone, which are indicative of warm and shallow marine environments. However, we have fossils spanning from almost the entire ancient Florida water depth profile. In the shallows, there was a forest of seagrass known as Thalassodendron Iacula, whose genus is now extinct in North America. This seagrass forest probably acted like a modern seagrass forest and provided habitat and nursery for many animals. There is a whole suite of invertebrate fossils, including scallops, snails, clams, sand dollars, sea urchins, sea biscuits, and a turia, which resembles a modern-day nautilus. Some of them preferred living on hard surfaces, while others preferred burrowing in the soft sand that existed at multiple depth levels. The vertebrate record of Eocene fossils is exquisite too, with fossils of swordfish, sea turtles, crocodiles, sea snakes, sharks, and dugons, which are alive today in the Indian Ocean and Southwest Pacific, and resemble manatees. Moving on to the Oligocene epoch, which lasted from about 34 to 23 million years ago, we see our first terrestrial fossils in Florida. Camelids, oreodonts, and the Calcathere moripus roamed on land. Oreodonts were a diverse group of mammals in size and shape that lived in a variety of habitats. Some say that they are sheep or pig-like. Moropus was a large herbivore with a horse-like body and long neck. What makes it distinct from other herbivores today and unites it with other calcathiers is its claw on its foot. In the marine environment, we also start to see the appearance of coral reefs, which started to change the marine ecosystem diversity to a modern composition. Now this carried over into the Miocene, 23 to 5 million years ago, where we see a fluctuating climate. Periodic cold and dry periods were a challenge for many tropical marine invertebrates, which went extinct by the end of the epoch. They were in turn replaced by other shells and tube worms, worms that secrete a substance, making a tube to live in. Up in the terrestrial realm, the vegetation starts looking like modern day Florida, with palms such as those from the genus Sable. In the river, we have alligators and turtles like today, but also river dolphins. On dry land, we find a wide array of mammals, which include giraffe camels, bear dogs, musk deer, and then rapids, which resemble saber-toothed cats. One of the most well-known sites of scientific discovery in Florida is Thomas Farm. This 18 million year old site yielded early horses such as the three-toed Archaeohippus, which aid in our understanding of horse evolution. Rhinos, dogs, bears, weasels, bats, rodents, amphibians, and a variety of birds, such as turkey songbirds, hawks, and doves, have all been found there too. The Miocene also represents a time of when species from other parts of the globe start moving into Florida. During this time, we find the shovel tusker Ambelodon, whose ancestors crossed the Bering Land Bridge between Russia and Alaska to get to Florida. From the south, we see the arrival of ground sloths about 9 million years ago. While North and South America were not connected yet, we think ground sloths might have been good swimmers based on the shape of their bones and the swimming abilities of modern tree sloths. The ground sloths coming in from South America represents the start of Gabby, or the Great American Biotic Interchange, in which species from both continents moved into each other. The land bridge between North and South America was completed during the Pliocene epoch, about 5 to 2 million years ago. From South America, 
North America gets armadillos, capybaras, manatees, opossums, and porcupines. We also see tapirs, giant armadillo-like pampithirs, and glyptodons, and the terror bird Titanus walleri. This bird could be over 8 feet tall and feed on mammals that were smaller than it. They didn't call the terror bird for nothing. In turn, from North America, bears, deers, cats, gonkathirs, otters, horses, and raccoons moved into South America. While this made travel between the continents easy for these animals, it shut off migration between the Gulf of Mexico and the Pacific Ocean. Furthermore, this affected ocean currents, which led to colder climates and extinction for many marine species. This brings us to the Pleistocene epoch, which lasted from 2 million to 11,700 years ago. Fossils from this time have been found in almost every county in Florida. Giant beavers, mammoths, mastodons, and saber-toothed cats all thrived here. As we can see, Florida certainly had a rich fossil record. Now, let's go check it out for ourselves and head on over to Victor at Rattlesnake Creek in Gainesville, Florida. This creek is called Rattlesnake Creek. If you didn't know, it's a tributary off of Hogstown Creek. Most of this stuff we're going to find is between about 10 and 5 million years old. Uh, and it's from what's called the Hawthorne Group in Gainesville. Uh, our museum basically treats all the creeks throughout Gainesville as one unit, but as you participate in field trips with this club, I guarantee you'll notice that you find different things when you go into different creeks. Um, so I did bring some of the things that I found in here before, so you're welcome to look. It's going to be mostly shark teeth and other kinds of bones. Um, you want to grab it and just pass it around, and I'll let you get a shot of it. So, basically what you're going to be doing while you're out there, it's going to be very sandy, but you're going to find areas that have coarser gravel built up, and you're going to use sifters often, or just surface collect. I have two sifters here, and another one in my car that people can borrow. Um, so, so, okay, we got plenty of sifters for people. Uh, looks like everyone has collecting bags. The other resource I wanted to talk to you about is this guy. Um, it's on the sharks and rays of the Gainesville Creeks. It has beautiful images to help you identify fossils, uh, and they're selling these for $10 online right now. And once they sell out of them, they're going to be free online, but I don't know how long that will take. One of the other things, just like general, for collecting in Florida, you actually have to have a permit typically. Um, it's $5 a year for the permit to collect any things with the exception of shark teeth. Shark teeth you can collect without a permit just because there's so many of them in Florida. They don't really care. Um, that is most of what I think we need. Uh, in terms of safety, everyone, ideally you should have closed-toed shoes because there is glass, but just be careful. Um, How do you get the permit, Victor? Uh, you can find the permit online by searching uh, Florida Museum of Natural History permit, and I'm, I'm sure you will find it, or vertebrate paleontology permit. That should be enough. All right. Let's get down there. You want to look at places that are gravelly. So the more gravel oh, there is, that's where the sharks tend to get caught up okay. under, under the water. Right? Yeah, well, a mixture, yeah. We want to walk a little bit, not directly here. There's always the glass. I think you guys can go too. We have anywhere between a dozen and 15 kids that are engaged at GHS, that are students at GHS. Uh, Lee Larson over at Buholtz has another about 8 to 10 kids and then uh, also today we have some elementary school and middle school kids aged out, uh, mostly younger siblings or uh, some of my co-workers wanted to come out with their kids when they found about the club, uh, so we've got some, some younger students here as well. Uh, all told we've got a group of about 20 here today. So. It's a uh, fish, fish mouth plate. Ah. Um, it's their teeth. You see all those little bumps all of those are little teeth. A bunch of teeth in the fish. Why are their teeth like this? Because they'll lose them or wear it down, so they have, instead of replacing their teeth like we replace it once, they've got a bunch of roses. We were doing a lot of paleontology in the classroom and we talked about how great it would be if we could get kids out here as well and get them engaged in science through authentic practices. So we wanted to show kids that anyone can be a paleontologist. Um, that if you, you know, come out and just look and take some time, you'll find things and we can learn a lot about how Earth has changed over time and learn about all of the different classroom concepts that we're already covering through a, a really entertaining, very dynamic field. Oh, this one's not a bone, this one's a rock. Here, look. 
these two pieces are bone. You see these lines? That's how you can tell. Here, keep this one so you can remember. Fragment of dugong bone. So I think that paleontology can be a really exciting field, especially for kids who might struggle to relate to or become interested in science content to begin with. It's a field that almost anyone can do. If you just go out, you know, here in Grant Gainesville, we've got fantastic uh, local paleontological resources between our Florida Museum of Natural History and then uh, also all of these creek systems. Um, one of the things that I did in my class was prior to coming out here, you know, we started with a goal of we're going to go to Rattlesnake Creek. It's right near, you know, GHS is a mile and a half away from here. Uh, and so I brought in creek media from this creek, from just sections where the kids are right now looking through, uh, and picked in and just brought in fossils that they could then look for uh, and take home. So that got them kind of easily engaged early on, and then they wanted to come out and find their own stuff. So once I did that activity, they then brought their friends and more kids got in, involved with it. And once I handed out permission slips, I had another little wave of kids come in and, and also want to participate and, and be a part of the club. Um, well, I'm interested in archaeology, so I thought that would be this would be a cool, fun thing to do too. So. All right, so right here we have a ray tooth. And you can tell it's a ray tooth because it is flat and it has these little tiny abrasions on it. So that's a pretty cool find right there. And this was just sitting right on the sand, on top of the sand. Let's see if we can find another one or something like that. Um, I learned a lot about the different kinds of teeth and ray plates and what they look like and it's, it's lots of fun. When you collect fossils from Florida creeks, make sure to write down which creek you are in and, if possible, where in the creek you are at. There is no special requirements for curating your fossils from Florida creeks. Just make sure to keep the locality info and the fossils together. Thank you for watching the 50 States of Fossils. If you're interested in collecting fossils in Florida, don't forget to look up your local paleontology clubs. We have plenty of different options here in Florida. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe to our page, join us on social media on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and of course, join the My Fossil website.